Thank you. So welcome everyone to the second talk of this four day May 2021 retreat at Mountain Cloud. Zen basics. Basic in the sense that Henry put it, a human being sitting is the whole of Zen. Basic in the fundamental sense that this practice is about you. It's about each one of us addressing questions that speak to the core of who we are. Basic in that we're all beginners. There is no other way. A first Zen retreat, one year in, many years of practice. It's all right now. Only now. Such a relief. So refreshing, so alive, and so unknown. In his opening talk yesterday, Henry led us up to the brink of awakening and then said, don't even think about it. but he had already shown it repeatedly, directly and indirectly. A finger, a flower, a beautiful arrangement, a wooden ball rolling across the floor of the zendo, a line from Dogen, whole world, nothing more than a little gleam of moonlight on a surface. This moon in a dewdrop. He showed it in a word about a path, a practice, a reality beyond words outside of scripture. And he had already shown it in each word, each sound. The seed of awakening, a pointer, and the fact itself. Intimate, immediate, fully immersed. But words fail. Words, this tradition notes, are like a finger pointing at the moon. Like reading the menu instead of tasting the feast, like scratching an itch through a thick leather boot. Instead of words, Zen has created and also along the way emerged from a language of a different order, the language of koans. Koans don't just point to the moon. The finger is the moon. Henry's still holding it up. The wooded ball is the fact. The flower is 
the whole of it, one bloom, two blooms, your whole body, intimate, immediate, fully immersed. Koans have been described as riddles or puzzles, but that's not at all how they function. There's nothing to solve or figure out, nothing to navigate, nowhere to get a hold. Koans function when they do like a sword, as the masters put it often, or a solvent, or an atomic acorn, obliterating supposed barriers, rendering void a lifetime of assumptions. can happen. Or like a fulcrum, a sudden moment of recognition. Sitting with a koan can be like sitting with a midwife, being born into your own skin. One sound, one phrase, maybe one exchange, blowing open the parameters of what we think we know, or sort of transposing us, lifting us from the bottom of a well where our range of vision was that little circle of sky. You know, that's it. And suddenly you're lifted up above the well and the view is open in every direction, no end in sight. You could say 360 degrees or 360 times 360. No hindrance. There's that line in the Heart Sutra. No hindrance of mind, therefore no fear. What could there be? to run into. Years ago, um, as a student at a session, I stood looking out a large pane glass window at a courtyard. We were on a break. There was a yellow wall stucco wall of a building and it met a red clay tile roof. And then a garden in a stage of bloom and a river beneath it. And on the other side, this gentle wooded hillside leading up to the mountains. It was a beautiful place. Each bit of the view, each surface, as diaphanous as sound and as precise as perfect pitch. I was a musician at the time, just 
looking. What is that? How can you name it? Each single thing, of course, empty, lacking any substance, and at the same time, utterly complete. Wherever I looked, one entirety, unique and unrepeatable. What language could possibly convey that? Music seemed the closest, but it was elusive. Koans. Koans can do it. That wonderful poet, hermit, artist, Zen master and self-described fool, Ryokan, has a verse about awakening. And it ends with these two lines. Once you've really seen things as they are, there's no more moon, no more finger. No moon, no finger. And yet here we are. Yesterday, speaking of this practice and the potential for a sudden shift, Henry said, there is so much more to what we are and to what we commonly experience and also much less, much more infinite capacity, nothing outside this, nothing lacking, and much less, so much less. Really, nothing at all. Such a wondrous nothing at all. A human being sitting is the whole of Zen. Koans address the whole of what it is to be a human being. So to explore the koan world, this living language of awakening, I'd like to uh, turn to two koans, a bit risky, but they come as a pair in the collection the, called the Blue Cliff Record or the Hekigan Roku. Secho, the poet, compiler, master of the Blue Cliff Record and who authored its verses he alludes to these two back-to-back -back cases as two horns of a black dragon, one meaning of a phrase in a verse. This black dragon, it's a poetic image, a mythical creature that embodies awakening, wisdom and compassion, another form of those two horns. total freedom and the power, the impulse, the necessity to act. In Secho's verse, the black dragon 
is the master in these twin cases. That is Unman. And it's also you. Your true nature, your intrinsic capacity, this great black dragon. So here's the first case. I want to take it up briefly, really as a window into koans. And then I hope to set the stage for the second case where we might have a glimpse of the whole dragon. So here is the Blue Cliff Record 14, the case. And conveniently, this case does not have an instruction. So the case. A monk asked Unman, what are the periods and teachings of the whole lifetime of Shakyamuni? Unman said, a preaching in accordance. This is Unman or Yunmin, that great ninth to 10th century master who lived near the end of the Tang dynasty in a time of tremendous political turmoil and loss. It so sadly resonates. So Unman, some 400 years after Bodhidharma, he was, Unman, a central figure in the development and use of koans. And he appears more than any other master in the three major koan collections that are part of the Sambo Zen curriculum. So we have the Mumon Khan, Gateless Gate, Blue Cliff Record, Book of Serenity or Book of Equanimity. Umban shows up 18 times in the Blue Cliff Record, eight in the Blue Book of Equanimity and five in the Gateless Gate. There's a range, a wonderful, vivid, dynamic range of his, his speech, his, so to speak, utterances. But he's known for these really short, terse responses, what are called, you know, known as Unman's one word barriers, sometimes called live words or old cases. I mean, many of you know these. What goes beyond what transcends all the Buddhas and the ancestors? Sesame rice cake. What is the pure Dharmakaya? What is the ultimate truth? What is the pure body of reality? And Unman says, single beautiful terse Japanese word for us, flowering hedge. In other words, the hedge around the privy or outhouse. Or a monk asks Unman, what is dust, dust, samadhi? Rice in the bowl, water in the pail. Another monk asks, what is Buddha? Kanchiketsu, tried shit stick. So there are volumes of commentary about the dried shit stick. The koans go on and on, many of them uh, cutting and turning in this way, these barriers. One I particularly love, he says it would be better not to have even the best thing. This after offering, unfolding your bright light. 
better not to have even the best things. And then that deepest of koans where Uman asks the monks, he speaks to the assembly, I'm not asking about the days leading up to the 15th, the full moon, tell me about the days after. Tell me about this life awake in an awake world. And Unman says, well, the koan says, he answered in their stead. Every day is a good day. That's an atonic acorn. That's a fulcrum. Breaking our heart all the way open. So here the question is, what are the periods and teachings of the whole lifetime of Shakyamuni. And Unman says, according to one translation, a teaching in accordance. Sometimes translated one preaching in accordance or one teaching accordingly. 49 years of the Buddhist teaching, which was traditionally divided into periods and types of teaching, all of it, the sum total of the lifetime of the Buddha. Unman says in Japanese, one word, taisetsu. One preaching accordingly. So just quickly, Unman, this master of language, himself had a saying about how language functions to convey the Dharma, about koans. They're uh, known as Yunmin's three phrases within a phrase, or one phrase should include three phrases. And those three elements, those three ways are the perfect fit of the box and the lid. Waves following waves and cutting all streams asunder. One turning word, one phrase, box and its lid, perfectly fitting, not the slightest gap, no wind of any kind can pass through, not a trace of doubt or a concept, nothing extra. Another way this gets translated, this box and lid is covering heaven and earth. So total, nothing outside it. So presenting a koan, this hand and glove. As we've heard, every koan is mu. And each koan presents this intimate world in a unique way. Wave upon wave or going along with the waves might be describing Unman who faces each student you know, responding to that student's understanding so naturally, you could also say this of a koan meeting you where you are. 
inundating you in its wave, just as you are. And then cutting all streams asunder, cutting off the stream, that mind road, the stream of concepts, delusions, judgments, assumptions, cutting to the marrow. When all is cut away, what remains? And what does the cutting It's not the teacher, not even the koa. It's you, the fact of who you are. This this, 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 this language. One teaching accordingly. So Uman seems to be saying whatever is asked, Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching matches it in accordance with the occasion, with the disciple, with the student, following the occasion meeting the reality of the questioner. Fine, really, really matters. Important to our practice. But where's the koan? Where's its function, its fulcrum? the turning word. What is the whole lifetime teaching of the Buddha? What is all of it? Who are you? What is this? Taisetsu. One preaching, even accordingly. This accordingly has no metrics. Taisetsu is nothing but mu. Taisetsu. Mu in three syllables or just tai. Nothing. <laughs> nothing nothing but you. So I'd like to turn to the partner koan, the next case in the Blue Cliff Record. This is case 15. And in this case, there is a short introduction by Master Engo, very short and very <laughs> instructive. <laughs> pointer. So I'll read the instruction in the case and then I hope at the end to have time to visit the verse. The instruction. A sword that kills, a sword that gives life. This is the traditional principle of old, the pivotal point of our time. Just tell me, where at present 
is the sword that kills, the sword that gives life. And Ingo writes, I will give you an example. Look. The sword that kills and gives life in a single cut. One single gesture. This is the sort of mu, the sort of a turning word, the sort of Unman's teaching. Bottom line, it's us, it's who we are. It's this empty, infinite world of no hindrance no boundary and 10,000 myriad things, such specificity. Where at present is it? This matter of life and death, this one true fact. Here's the case. A monk asked Unman, what is it when it is not an activity at this moment? So not an activity of the mind at this moment, nor is it a thing at this moment. Unman said, a preaching in the reverse, or a reverse teaching, or more recently, our wonderful translator, Migaku Sato Roshi, has rendered this response from Unman exactly so. One teaching Exactly so. A monk asks, what is it when the mind is still? No thought arising, no thing coming into view, no distraction. Wow, look at this sitting. What then? <laughs> the monk asks about it, what is it, when? What is this true fact? What is it that has nothing to do with objects of thought or things in the world? What kind of it is that? Yamada Kon Roshi comments, I love this. Most people would be driven up a wall by this question, but Unman answers immediately. Exactly so. This monk is tied up in a concept as if who we really are, this real life, Buddha nature, essential nature, your original face, your native ground, your original spontaneity, as if all of that, that one thing, has nothing to do with thoughts or things or whatever arises in this world. However lofty we might think it is to sit so still. This monk is entangled in a divided world. What then is it? Exactly so.
all those questions yesterday and every time before about our sense of lack, about the challenge of loving ourselves, about this ache in the heart. Exactly so. The word in Japanese is toi setsu. It was tai setsu, now toi setsu. Again, nothing but mu. So I just have to say, was sitting with this this morning, another koan from Unman just leapt to mind. This is, um, I'm just gonna mention it because it's so fitting. From Book of Equanimity 19, a monk asks Unman, not a single thought arises. Is there any fault or not? Similar question. And Unman there, preaching in accordance. Mount Sumeru. I mean, this Mount Sumeru blows everything away. At the same time, exactly so, presenting great fault. There it is. Box and lid, wave upon wave, perfectly cutting wisdom and compassion, hand in hand. So let's look at Secho's verse, maybe get a feel for this wisdom and compassion. The verse is poetic and multivalent, you know, really part of Secho's gift is this richness of making meaning on all these different levels or different angles. But however you read it, and we're gonna read it fairly simply, it's pointing to the heart of the matter. As Bodhidharma said, directly pointing to the shin the true human heart, the great empty firmament. Here's the verse. I'll read it and then look at it a bit line by line. A preaching in reverse or one preaching exactly so. The tally was divided. Dying and living together, I will resolve it for your sake. 84,000 were not phoenix feathers. 33 persons went into tiger's dens. <coughs> Remarkable, remarkable, rushing, lapping, the moon in the water. This moon just a few days till the flower moon, almost full, but here, completely full, always full. Unman was a great, great grandfather in the Dharma of Secho. So 
Sacho begins by quoting the verse, this great appreciation for Unman. One teaching, exactly so. And then the tally was divided. A tally, uh, you may know this, um, I had to check. It's um, an old device for making a contract. So you take one wooden plate and write something on it and then cut it into, and two people each get a piece. The idea is that when they come, after whatever amount of time, and put these two pieces together, it fits into a perfect whole. You know these two are the original match. So in this case, such as pointing to, the monk is holding the tally and he cannot see how to put it together. The world where there is nothing at all, nothing. And this other side with his thoughts, emotions, sensations, all of this arising. For the monk, these two halves are divided and he cannot see how to make them fit. Unman's response, one way of seeing it, of receiving it, is that it puts the tally together. Exactly so. One original entirety, a perfect fit to the monk's predicament. Somehow the whole koan comes to life, both of them. Unique and unrepeatable. One tally, one indivisible fact. And then the next line, dying together, living together. This is this practice. It's teacher and student, and it's the reality. This one body. Unman embodies it for the monk and for us. For his part, Secho collected a hundred koans, composed a verse for each koan for the sake of his students, for the sake of those to come, for us. They did it for the Dharma, but it's the Dharma that's doing it. There's a pointer here. When we say let who do everything, that's already going on. Dying together, living together, that one 
who says, I can't put these two together. That's it. That's whole. I can't do it. There it is. Completely whole. The whole of it. The monk is putting it together right there. I don't know how to do this. I can't settle down. My knees are hurting. How can I see? This empty, infinite world of constant change and total dynamism, this topsy-turvy world in a sense, this luminous, effinescent, all-pervading world is none other than this world. There it is. put together. Exactly so. From the start. Exactly as you are. Right here in our searching, our longing, even our confusion, it's nothing but the shin, the one heart manifesting, showing itself, this heart of compassion. I have to say boundless, it's boundless compassion, pouring itself out. The verse goes on, 84,000 were not phoenix feathers. 33 persons went into tiger's dens. So according to Chinese legend, a phoenix is a great child worthy of inheritance. 84,000 could refer to the number of persons or beings earthly, heavenly, everyone gathered to hear Shakyamuni Buddha's preaching. Henry presented this yesterday, a throng gathered to listen, waiting on bated breath for Shakyamuni Buddha to speak. As it turned out, his last sermon, his last preaching, his last teaching publicly, Buddha picks up a flower. Kashapa smiles. This one recognition. Don't even need to say that. 84,000 are not phoenixes. They're waiting. They don't see. What will he say? Already there, already done, already completely exposed, utterly, totally. They don't see, but the Dharma continues for everyone. 33 persons went into tiger's dens. So Secho points to the 33 ancestors, the masters, 28 in India, six in China, up to Huineng, the sixth Chinese ancestor, and Bodhidharma, the last in India and the first in China, counts twice. 
33. These 33 can do the courageous feat of teaching. They can convey the Dharma. 84,000, not so much. 33, really do. It seems an immeasurably wide disparity. Those 33 who went into tiger dens, tiger's dens, as Secho says, presumably taking the cubs, Lots of courage, lots of clarity. Why did they do it? For us, for the 84,000, for the millions in their wake, these 33 are ancestors for us by virtue of the world, they open up. It's even difficult to put that in the past tense. What would that mean? It's right now, opening up right here. Where else can it be? Shakyamuni Buddha is still practicing. So what about these 33, these great ancestors? It's each one of us. It's the sitting. Whole human heart sitting. At this moment, maybe listening, speaking. We could say hand in hand with the ancestors, following their path, taking this up with this deep intention, actually going deeper. So for the sake of 84,000 or 10 million, or just one, for the sake of one. For the sake of one. Remarkable, remarkable, the last line of the verse. Rushing, lapping, the moon in the water. Moon in the water. This reflection. So beautiful. Shining, translucent. But nothing to get. As Henry said, the whole world is nothing more than a little gleam of moonlight on a surface. Dogen expounds on that, this moon in a dewdrop, this whole entire existence in a drop of dew, even the reflection on a drop of dew. All the sitting, all the pain, all the joy, all the awakening, nothing but a reflection. Transparent, empty, and illumining 
everything. Everything springing from it. Nothing of substance. And yet, here we are. It's us. Each one of us. Each of the 33, each of the 84,000. Moon on the water. The full moon. No distinction can divide it. Whatever you do to this tally, even the slightest bit of it is the whole. So uh, now I'm well out of time. I'd like to close with um, a short discourse by Dogen that if there is one, I could say I carry around sort of tucked in near to the heart. It's about this Bodhisattva vow and this aching sense of lack and this teaching this turning word, exactly so. Here it is. The teacher Dogen said, 2000 years later, we are the descendants of Shakyamuni. 2000 years ago, he was our ancestral father. He is muddy and wet from following and chasing after the waves. It can be described like this, but also there is the principle of the way that we must make, that we do make one mistake after another. What is this like? Whether Buddha is present or not present, I trust she is right under our feet. Face after face is Buddha's face. Fulfillment after fulfillment is Buddha's fulfillment. That fulfillment right here. Let's taste and see. Thank you so much for listening, for this long listening and this shared practice.